Are we recording too? Yep, we're recording. We started. Okay. So, so I'll put on the presentation. All right, can everyone hear us all right? Yep. All right, Steve, I'll pay all right. attention to make sure if anyone joins. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you a question. What is the first thing that pops into your mind when you hear the word bacteria? So you can unmute, unmute yourself or you can put it in the chat box, but I'd like to hear your answer. I think of germs and dirt. Germs, dirt, what else? Sickness. Okay. Ammonia, nitrogen, disease. Okay, so most, most of the comments are, as I suspected that they would be, are negative. That when you think of bacteria, you think of germs, you think of dirt, you can think of disease, you think of food spoilage, but uh, bacteria a lot more than that. So I'd like to dispel some of this myth about bacteria being terrible, awful, that we have to eradicate. And that's going to be the focus of my presentation. So I, I titled this, Our Friends the Bacteria, because really there are thousands and thousands of species of bacteria are out there. And most of them are either totally harmless or in fact are very useful for us. So um, throughout recorded history, we've had a number of uh, serious bacterial diseases. Of course, most people didn't even realize that these diseases were caused by bacteria. You see um, illustrations, for example, uh, Peter Bruegel, the elders uh, painting uh, the triumph of death right here in the middle. I can use this cursor here. I've got no sound. Does anyone have sound? Oh, sorry. Um, I apologize. Are you having issues being able to hear here? Can most of you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. All right. Loud and clear. I'm okay. Yeah, me too. Yeah, you're fine, Steve. Okay. Yeah, Bob and Ann hear you. Hi, Bob. How are you doing? Good, good. All right. We're making sure that everybody can hear us. So throughout recorded history and probably long before that, we've, we've had some serious diseases. Of course, most people for most of the time didn't realize that these were called bacteria that, or were caused by bacteria or other microorganisms. And there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about that in a second. But you see some illustration. So Peter Bruegel, the elders um, triumph of death uh, showing uh, the um, effects of the bubonic plague as is the next illustration over here. Where's my cursor? Oh. Uh, you can actually see in this illustration uh, the uh, pustules or buboes that are caused by bubonic plague. Um, people eventually realized that there was something in the water. So cholera a serious disease, potentially deadly disease, even before they knew that these were caused by bacteria, they realized that boiling the water was very helpful. Of course, in modern times, we have um, uh, massive E. coli outbreaks occasionally caused by contaminated food or, or food products, such as you see here in this cartoon on the right, and of course, um, other types of outbreaks like this listeria outbreak that, that is illustrated here on the right. So these are kind of age groups too. Okay, go ahead. This is a little bit busy uh, of a diagram, but it shows some of the uh, organisms, bacterial organisms that are involved in human diseases. But I don't know how much you can read this, but in fact, there are only about 20, 25 microorganisms of the bacterial type that cause the vast majority of our diseases. 
So for example, you see uh, the word, uh, words up here, Streptococcus pneumoniae. This is an organism that you see several times affecting several different body systems. So although this list seems rather lengthy, it's actually only a handful of organisms like Staphylococcus, Haemophilus, and so on and so forth that cause the vast majority of our diseases. One of the reasons that, um, that, we, that we spend so much time talking about bacterial diseases is that most of our attention is focused on these diseases. And that's not where I wanna go with this. So once, once we get past these couple of slides, I'm going to talk to you about some uh, beneficial aspects of bacteria. Another reason that we fear these microorganisms is because we can't see them. This uh, particular cartoon illustrates um, the fact that most bacteria are microscopic and that we cannot uh, visualize them. So I have this little cartoon flying in here, a picture of a nickel. If you take this nickel and turn it on its side, it's about a little over one millimeter thick. Now imagine one one thousandth of that one millimeter and you obviously cannot see it with the naked eye. And we're always fear things that we cannot see. So we fear the dark, we fear organisms in the dark we fear things that uh, we are unable to visualize. And of course, uh, bacteria are in the one micrometer to about five to 10 micrometer range. And that's not something that we can see without the aid of a light microscope. So um, it's, it's something that uh, is kind of mysterious to us and we can be stricken without ever realizing that these microorganisms are around us. So that's another reason why bacteria have such bad uh, rap, if you will. In modern times, the first person to record at least or to, that he saw bacteria was the um, uh, Dutch businessman, uh, Leeuwenhoek. Uh, he was not a scientist, but he tinkered around with optics and he was a successful businessman. So he had a little bit of time on his hands and he constructed the first handheld microscope in modern times. And I say modern times because it's quite conceivable that thousands of years ago, the Egyptians or perhaps in China, uh, they already had something like a microscope and they could visualize things, but uh, that was lost through the ages, not to be discovered, rediscovered until the uh, 1600s. So Leeuwenhoek, the 17th century individual who first uh, reported on seeing what he called little animalcules in a droplet of water. He didn't know of course what these were. Most of these were bacteria and some protozoa but he at least recorded them or talked about them and uh, is sometimes called the father of microscopy for that reason. So bacteria can be classified in many different ways, where they live, what kind of life form they have, what they do for a living. But here, here's a common, um, way of classifying bacteria based on the shape of the cells. Well, first of all, uh, bacteria are single celled organism. The entire body is composed of a single cell. Even when they occur in groups or clusters, like you see two cells attached over here or a necklace-like arrangement of cells or grape-like clusters of cells, each cell is an individual. So we can classify bacteria based on their shape. Oh, my son is here too, as a guest. Excellent. So it's a family affair to some extent. 
<laughs> we can classify a bacteria based on shape. If they're round, we call it a coccus or spherical shape. There are rod-shaped organisms called uh, bacilli or bacillus. And then there are these corkscrew shape or spiral shaped organisms uh, that uh, also exist. Uh, sometimes two or more cells are stuck together. So if you see two cells like over here, we refer to it as a diplococcus. If they occur in chains, then we refer to it as a strepto arrangement. So you're familiar with streptococcus uh, from strep infections, or they can occur in um, clusters, grape-like clusters, like you see here in the bottom, and that's called a staphylo arrangement. So staphylococcus or staph infections uh, refer to organisms that occur in chain-like cluster or, or in uh, grape-like clusters like this. The same is true for the rod-shaped organisms, although the spiral-shaped organisms never form an association. They always exist as individual cells. So that's one common way of classifying them. Then of course, uh, most of them have no color and we have to color them. And that's another way of classifying them uh, by the common staining technique that we use called gram negative or gram positive organisms, which color them either blue or a reddish color, okay? Uh, bacteria were not recognized as organisms as such until probably the uh, mid 19th, uh, 19th century, when finally scientists accepted that bacteria uh, as organisms can cause disease and in fact are everywhere in the environment around us. All right, enough about bacteria that cause disease or some introduction about bacteria. Let's talk a little bit about all the good bacteria that are out there, which is after all the focus of my presentation. So I have a list up here and I'm going to talk about some of these in a little bit more detail. Obviously I don't have time to go into every single topic in depth uh, in a short presentation like this, but um, we'll talk a little bit about where they're useful in agriculture, for example, in, in nutrient fixation. And we'll, we'll specifically talk about that a little bit uh, utilizing them as biopesticides, as uh, feed producing uh, organisms for domestic livestock. We'll talk about it, their role in food production, including things like fermentation and the production of various types of foods and beverages. We'll uh, mention a little bit about bioremediation, uh, for example, removing heavy metals like cadmium or lead from contaminated soils. There are organisms that uh, eat, if you will, hydrocarbons so that they're used in cleaning up oil spills or various types of toxic materials. Uh, there are a number of medical uses. So not only do they cause disease, but they're also useful in, in medication uh, production or vitamin production or even in beauty products. Uh, one of the medicines that I'll mention right now is um, uh, the production of genetically modified bacteria that produce insulin and we use lots and lots of insulin because there are many people who are diabetics. In the old days, um, uh, insulin was basically uh, procured from um, farm animals by removing their blood and then purifying the hormone from that. Today, we can make um, insulin in large quantities in modern facilities at a fraction of the cost of what it used to be and without hurting the uh, farm animals from which we used to get the uh, uh, insulin. Uh, bacteria are used in the production of vitamins and even in beauty products. So for example, you've heard of Botox which is a product that is used to relax facial muscles and it, as, a, as a rejuvenating or, or making you younger looking individual. 
Uh, that, of course, is a temporary fix, but the uh, botulinum toxin is used in very small quantities to, um, um, for, for these purposes. There are a number of environmental benefits. Think, for example, how we would be probably knee high or higher in the dead bodies of organisms if it weren't for the decomposing bacteria and other microorganisms that uh, dispose of dead bodies. Uh, yes, there are carrion eaters. Yes, there are um, other means of uh, decomposing, but uh, the vast majority of the composition is taken care of by bacterial organisms. They're a food source for many microscopic creatures. If you take a handful of soy, for example, there are millions and millions of tiny little organisms that are impossible to see with the naked eye. And many of these little larvae of insects or nematode worms uh, consume bacteria as their major food source. There are even photosynthetic bacteria. These used to be called blue-green algae, but today we know that they're not algae at all, but in fact are uh, bacteria. In fact, some of the earliest organisms that we know of in the history of life were photosynthetic bacteria that uh, have been preserved in rocks that are about three to three and a half billion, that's with a B, billion years old. So these are ancient organisms that have been around for a long, long time. And they occupy just about every niche and every possible um, uh, surface of the earth, including the human body. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, bacteria are used in research. Some of, the, of our earliest understanding of genetics came from um, working with bacteria. So our understanding of DNA or how biochemistry of the body occurs and is uh, uh, conducted came from um, uh, bacterial models because they're simple organisms. Their genetics are pretty simple, although uh, their DNA is basically identical to ours in its building blocks. And so we have been able to learn a lot from uh, bacteria by uh, using them as, as tools in engineering, genetics, and other scientific endeavors. We can use bacteria for industrial reasons. In fact, uh, they're used extensively in uh, wastewater treatment uh, facilities as, as part of um, cleansing the water. They're used uh, in lots of different applications including manufacturing adhesives, organic acids, acetone, various types of other uh, materials. And they're used in manufacture of bioplastics. Some of these are cutting edge scientific and uh, industrial uses that uh, we keep perfecting as we learn more about their uh, biochemistry. And of course, they are integral inhabitants of all plant and animal bodies. Okay, so let's take a couple of these and talk about them in a little bit more detail. So first I'd like to uh, use some examples of bacteria and how they're used in agriculture. And I'm going to focus on an organism called Bacillus thuringiensis, which is used in insect control, perhaps you're familiar with this product called BT, which is used for insect control. We'll talk a little bit about uh, rhizobium and their role in nitrogen fixation as part of uh, the body of legumes. And then we'll also talk a bit about the nitrogen cycle as it's in, as it's, and its importance in um, agriculture and the growth of plants. So first, a little bit about Bt. Uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is a common uh, soil-dwelling organism, but its various strains have been used in uh, controlling insects or insect larvae. Uh, and you see a little inset um, of, of a gypsy moth uh, caterpillar over here, and the product can be used uh, 
in this case, BTK, which is specific for certain types of caterpillars and um, uh, different strains are used in mosquito control and, and other uh, uh, controlling of other um, potentially dangerous or harmful insects. The organism itself is a rod-shaped bacterium, as you see the electron micrograph over here in the upper right-hand corner. And um, the, the little strands that you see over here, the little slimy strands are actually used as locomotor appendages by the bacterial cells themselves. Um, you can purchase BT either as a liquid or as powder and you see in, in the inset, the box that um, you can order or, or purchase from uh, a supply store and reconstitute in water, spray it on the plant. They've even taken this organism and they genetically engineered corn and other um, um, crops that already contain the Bacillus thuringiensis genes which kill the insect larvae. The um, organism works by producing a toxin which paralyzes the intestinal tract of its host, in this case, a harmful insect, and the uh, insect larvae essentially start to death in a matter of a few hours. So it's very effective. And um, because we keep making newer versions of this product, the or, um, target organisms uh, haven't really um, developed a great deal of resistance to them as yet, but of course they will. All right, so let's talk about another application or another use of bacteria in agriculture. And that is a mutualistic symbiotic association between certain types of plants that we call legumes and certain bacteria that belong in the genus Rhizobium. So in the upper left-hand corner, you see uh, the roots of a plant that are infected by um, the Rhizobium bacterium. And this bacterium um, develops inside the root, roots and produces these nodules. And the beauty of this bacterium and several other uh, types of bacteria that live in soil is that they can fix nitrogen gas from the air. Now, you might recall from your basic chemistry that uh, most of air that we breathe in is nitrogen. In fact, 78% of air is nitrogen. Uh, we breathe it in and we breathe it out. In other words, it's totally unusable to us. There is a reason for that. The, the molecular nitrogen, um, the, the atoms are bonded together with three uh, strong bonds that are very difficult to break. And only certain types of organisms can do this, namely um, bacteria in the soil that can convert nitrogen gas by using an enzyme called nitrogenase. They convert this into a more accessible product called ammonia. The ammonia then is utilized uh, for the manufacture of various types of amino acids and other products that then are available to the plant uh, from the soil and, and, and the roots can take this up. The plant then utilizes the uh, various nitrogen products uh, to make its own bodies in the form of nucleic acids, proteins, hormones, and various other products and assimilate uh, these into, its, into their bodies. And then of course, um, the plant can then carry out photosynthesis, uh, produce various types of organic acids, sugars, et cetera, which then the bacterium can utilize. So this is a truly um, beneficial association for both types of organisms and um, peas, beans, um, clover, red clover, alfalfa, and even some trees like um, locust trees uh, belong to this group called legumes that can harbor these types of bacteria. 
Well, you might remember the nitrogen cycle from your basic biology. And this is a little bit busy diagram, but I'm gonna take you through it uh, step by step. So we have the nitrogen fixing bacteria, which can either live uh, freely in soil. So these would be Clostridia, Nitrosomonas, uh, Aerobacter, and several other types of bacteria that live freely in soil or they can be part of the legume that we just talked about a moment ago. They can then take nitrogen from the air as previously mentioned and convert it into ammonia. This cursor is very difficult to find. You just have to move it around a little bit more so to, yeah, it's, it's a little finicky. Yeah. So convert it into ammonia. And then this ammonia, the NH3 that you see over here, is utilized by then other bacteria, also living in the soil, that convert the ammonia into nitrites. The nitrates are then converted by uh, these bacteria into nitrates. And nitrates is something that is directly utilizable by plants. In fact, for thousands of years before the manufacture of synthetically available nitrogen fertilizers, um, this was the way that uh, plants got their nitrogen supply. Today, of course, you can go to um, a supply house and buy ammonium nitrate fertilizer. And it's, it's a very effective fertilizer, but it wasn't until the 1920s when the Haber-Bosch uh, process was developed by some German chemists that we were able to manufacture this synthetic form of um, nitrogen. The nitrogen then can be taken up or directly assimilate. I can't find this cursor. The, um, the nitrate can be directly assimilated into the bodies of plants or the bodies of animals. And the excess that isn't uh, utilized or when the plant dies or when an animal dies is then acted up by another group of bacteria that denitrifying bacteria. And these are also common soil dwellers. So all of these bacteria live in soil, the nitrogen fixing, the nitrifying, the, uh, the nitrifying bacteria, which then return uh, nitrogen back into the air. So we essentially have a circular path, a, a completion of a cycle, if you will. So without these bacteria in the soil, for thousands of years, we would not have been able to grow crops because one of the essential ingredients that plants must get from the soil is nitrogen. And um, okay. Oops. Okay, I guess I'm ready to move on to the next one anyway. Let's talk a bit about food and beverages that are uh, manufactured or made with the aid of bacteria. And this is not an all-inclusive list. This is just some of the, the products that we make with uh, the aid of bacteria. Chocolate, vinegar, beer, coffee, beets, cheese. And I broke cheese out into many different types of cheese on the bottom. Uh, tofu, miso, sausages, uh, certain types of bread, uh, fermented fish products, uh, kimchi or sour, sauerkraut, which are basically kind of similar from different cultures. Yogurt, wine, cider, butter, buttermilk, kefir, cottage cheese, and the list just goes on and on and on. Of course, people have utilized these um, processes for thousands of years without being aware that the bacteria were involved in with, with them, but they knew enough that uh, you needed a starter culture for many of these products. And they would utilize these star starter cultures with their basic uh, raw materials and make these value-added products at the end. 
with respect to the different types of cheese. Um, this is again, a not, not an all inclusive list. Some of these cheeses I'm not even familiar with personally, but many of us recognize things like Parmesan, Pecorino, Emmental is a, is a very fine Swiss cheese, cheddar cheese, and one of my favorites, uh, although I never eat this unless I'm alone for a long period of time, is Limburger cheese because, oh, it's so delicious, but boy, does it stink that I haven't. So <laughs> it's not something that I would, I would eat in the company of others. But again, let's talk a couple of uh, specifics. And I'm going to use um, chocolate and beer to talk about specifically. And how can you go wrong when you talk about chocolate and beer, right? All right, so in order to make chocolate, we start with the cocoa bean. The cocoa beans come from the cocoa tree, the uh, Theobroma cocoa tree. If you don't take these beans and ferment them, then you're not gonna have chocolate because these beans are themselves inedible. They, they're just not going to become any type of useful product. There are numerous bacteria that are involved in the production of chocolate. And this is an orderly succession. In other words, uh, one bacterium has to be present before another one can do its job. So when the uh, pods are harvested, it's, uh, it's sort of like a, like a legume in that it produces pods in which there are beans. The beans are taken out of the pods and they're either put into boxes or they're thrown on the ground. And that's where they become contaminated with the bacteria. But in this case, contamination is a good thing. The first types of bacteria that act on these beans are the lactic acid bacteria. They make uh, a lactic acid intermediate product. And a couple of the ones I mentioned over here are lactobacillus and streptococcus. Now you see the word streptococcus. This is the same genus, which in some cases, a different species of streptococcus, but in some cases can cause human disease in, uh, various situations, but this is, this is a different species of streptococcus that's specifically used as a bacterium to ferment the chocolate uh, into a lactic acid type product. Then come the acetic acid bacteria, the acetobacter and gluconobacter, and they must be present before the third type, the bacillus, the endospore forming rods act upon it. The entire process of harvesting beans to um, uh, making a, a, a precursor of chocolate takes about uh, five to seven days. And then uh, after the endospore forming rods can do their job, then you can take the um, material and add various types of sugars and whatnot to it because uh, it's, it's a rather um, bitter product without adding sugar to it. But then, then we will have, eventually we will have chocolate. But again, no bacteria, no chocolate, okay? <laughs> In the production of beer, there's a whole list of microorganisms that are involved. Of course, we're most familiar with the yeast, the Saccharomyces yeast, because those are the ones that are gonna be producing the alcohol eventually. But there are a whole lot of different microorganisms, including fungi and a whole slew of bacteria that are involved. And again, this is an orderly process. So we start with a, some type of grain which we're gonna crush into uh, a multi type of material and adding hot water to it, we make mash. The grain could be any number of grains. It could be wheat, could be rice, could be what have you, but most often uh, for most beer production, it's going to be barley. Uh, so the mash is then uh, put into these large kettles and boiled 
and the, the liquid that is drawn off of it is called wort. This wort is then what is going to become uh, uh, the, the product of fermentation by adding the yeast to it. Uh, cannot find this cursor here. Um, by adding the yeast to it and then the process of fermentation uh, occurs. Now, there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of beers out there. And um, microbrewing has become a very popular uh, pastime in the past 20, 30 years. There, there are entire textbooks written on the microbiology of brewing things, uh, brewing beer, as well as other uh, fermented alcoholic products. Most beer is going to contain somewhere between three to 6% alcohol. And once we get to about six or 7% alcohol, the uh, high alcohol content is going to kill the microorganisms that are present in the beer. And then um, uh, the um, product is going to go uh, undergo storage for several weeks what is called lagering. Uh, so lager beers are stored for a period of time, but there are many other types of beer or ale that are used, uh, that are made by the use of various types of bacteria, as well as um, several other types of fungi. So you can get all kinds of uh, different types of beer uh, from pale ale to um, dark um, beers that, uh, you know, rather flat. Uh, the, the, um, the last step before lagering is to add carbon dioxide. So if you don't add carbon dioxide, then you're gonna end up with a flat kind of a dark beer that is favored by some people, sort of like a, a Guinness type of product. And finally, I'd like to close by coming back to the human being. But in this case, the human being uh, benefiting from microorganisms. Uh, this again is a rather busy slide. There are a lot of different numbers on here, but let's just look at a couple of them. Uh, the 100 trillion symbiotic microbes live in and on every person. So they're not only present in our bodies, mostly in the intestinal tract, but again, in other places as well. But they're also present on our skin. They're present as normal flora in our mouth. And, and there, as well as in our skin, they protect us from potentially harmful microbes, microorganisms. In our intestinal tract, of course, there are lots of different types of uh, microorganisms, not just bacteria, but also protozoa and even some viruses that are harmless to us or actually are useful for us. And you can see this number 10,000 here on the bottom left. It says um, the number of different uh, microorganisms, different species of microorganisms that inhabit the human body or the animal body. So in the intestinal tract, of course, they're very useful. Here in the intestinal tract, where most of the bacteria in our body live, uh, they produce precursors of vitamins. So vitamin K is not gonna be made by the liver unless um, there's a precursor that's made by bacteria in our gut. And you know what happens sometimes when we take an antibiotic? Sometimes the normal, beneficial flora are also killed. And that's when we have various types of intestinal problems, things like diarrhea, because we have killed off not only the harmful organism that we wanna target, but also the useful ones that we, we would like to keep in our bodies. So um, uh, here's another little statistic here on the bottom, this two kilogram, if you were to take all the bacteria and all the microorganisms that are in our bodies, they would add up to about two kilograms or um, uh, five pounds, four and a half, five pounds uh, 
material just from our bodies. So this is not, when we want to lose weight, this is not the, the weight that we want to lose. Okay, so I, I hope that I've taken you to a little whirlwind tour of microorganisms that are beneficial for us. And that's the end of my presentation. And, and I'd like to um, entertain some questions if you have them. Hey, Steve, I got a question for you. Sure. Um, when you're talking about nitrogen, uh, the get nitrogen from the air, are you talking about through rainfall in that? No, nitrogen in the air is what you breathe in all the time, right now, at this very moment. But, but how does it how does it get down into the soil to the um, to the bacteria? How does it get down there? Well, uh, the the top layer of soil where the bacteria live uh, is aerated. Air, in other words, air gets in there in, in between the um, um, soil particles. Oh, okay. We're, we're not talking about three or four feet deep. We're talking about the first several inches of, of soil of surfaces. Oh, okay, thank you. Sure. Other questions? Oh, I have a question. The three types of bacteria you talked about, the nitrogen fixing and the nitro... Nitrite and the... Nit yes, and the denitrification. Denitrification. Um, and they're all found in the soil naturally. Are they dangerous to humans or animals? Or no. is it something we no. have no issue no. with? At all? No, they, they don't care about us. No. Isn't that nice? No, they, they strictly do that. They, there are, in fact, right now on us, in us, there are hundreds, if not thousands of different microorganisms that could care less about us. If anything, they are going to protect us so for example, if you look at the normal flora in the mouth, um, the normal bacteria are protecting us from potentially harmful bacteria. And, and here is where all the use of antimicrobial products is actually detrimental in the long run. I never ever buy soap that has antibacterial uh, clandestine or other products added to it, not only because they become resistant, bacteria become resistant to these antimicrobial products, but because they're totally unnecessary. Water cleanses your hands. The purpose of the soap is to act as an emulsifier to, to create an interface between water and some types of dirt. And the antimicrobial product is totally unnecessary. I hear they're bad for your septic system as well. Well, yes, they're bad for your septic system because your septic system relies mostly on a bacterial decomposition of the solid material. Yes, absolutely. So when I have my chocolate, wine, beer, and cheese tonight, I'll thank my bacteria. <laughs> yeah. Yes, thank you. yes, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I just have another question, Steve. When you're talking about Bt, now are there different species uh, to affect the different um, larvae, or do they all they're, just one? They're all Bt, Bacillus thuringiensis, but there are different subspecies or varieties or whatever you want to call them, different mm -hmm. versions of it, and those different versions are specific to different types of insects. So for example, the ones that kill uh, mosquitoes are not going to be useful for um, insects in the, in the garden. Uh, oh, okay, thank for, you. Yeah. I, I'm, I have a quick question. Sure. Professor, that was brilliant to use chocolate and beer. It was a great way to get us into this. <laughs> but I'm wondering how did human, early humans develop this affinity to using these things. I mean, beer and meat have been brewed forever. And how did any indication of how we knew about these things when it began? I, I think it was trial and error. The, the same way that we started growing certain types of crops, people made observations. They realized that there was something in their starter mixture that would improve the taste, the texture, the speed with which the product was made or the palatability of the product. I think it was strictly by observation um, 
human beings, as well as many other animals, are, are smart. They, they quickly learn that if something works, even if they don't know why it works specifically at that particular time, they, they will utilize it. And um, the, the earliest fermented alcoholic products were made by nature, but people quickly discovered that there was something in these fermented uh, fruits or, or materials that would make them feel good. They started collecting uh, the, the material from which then they started making wine, beer, and various other spirits without knowing exactly why it worked. Well, thank you. Sure. Phil, I actually had a pretty similar question written down here because it's just, I think it's pretty crazy. It's like chocolate itself, like in order to get the beans, you need to be able to stress out the plant. So like specific metabolites in the bean plant actually grow the beans. Isn't that how that works? Yeah. So like on top of that, you need to learn how to ferment, ferment and then also use the right bacteria in order to get it to actually form the chocolate. I think it's just mind blowing that yeah. you've come that far just from making a sweet. Well, yeah. the, the, the history of microbiology and the history of agriculture are all, all fascinating. Uh, as far as we know, modern agriculture can be traced back to about 12,000 years, somewhere in the Middle East, but there's probably some other um, evidence that we haven't found yet uh, in Asia or other places. But modern agriculture, as we know it, probably started somewhere in the Middle East, um, modern day Israel or in, in, that, in that area. Of the Middle East, and um, people just just started um, experimenting. And when the Jews were wandering around the desert and had unleavened bread, it's because they did not have the the sort of products with which to uh, to make the, um, the the dough rise that we're familiar with today. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Was was coffee on your list there of the fermented foods? Is is co are coffee beans fermented? No, no. No. Coffee beans you buy green and then you roast them. Oh, right. Okay. Or, or you buy them already roasted. Yeah. So uh, one one more quick one. That last slide I saw a, looked like a ratio, five to one, viruses to bacteria. Yes, Did that, I read that right? That was interesting to me as well. Um, there are many scientists that believe that a large portion of our genome, that is our genetic material, actually came from viruses of various cool. types. Um, uh, our association with wild animals as food sources, and then later as domesticated animals, um, allow the transfer of bits and pieces of genetic material from wild animals via viruses into our own bodies. So that potentially a considerable portion of our bodies um, are, are from other animals as well as from viruses that those other animals harbor. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Steve, yeah. this is Bob, Bob and Ann. Uh, uh, question, uh, question about uh, an athletic event that I remember reading about several years ago. It involves this sport, and we'll put that in quotes, called roller derby, in which people do crazy things on a, a small track and effectively beat up on each other. But I remember reading once that someone did something to look at the microbiome of the members of one team and the microbiome of the members of the other team, and they were different. But then after the game, you know, with all this physical contact and banging into one another and falling on top of one another, the microbiome started to get mixed. Have you ever heard that? Do you think that it's possible that one could measure that? Uh, I'm, I haven't heard this particular example, but yes, we're all we're all a connection collection of individual microbes, and yet we acquire microbes from other people all the time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by that. I, I didn't hear this particular example. 
Yeah, I, I, I just might mention, um, you know, much of the time during the age of discovery, when ships from Europe were going all over the Pacific and, and all of that, much of the time, what they drank was not water. It was, well, it was beer, which right. of course is a solution to water. Simply, they would make a weak beer, it'd be low alcohol, maybe two, three percent, simply because they discovered it kept a lot better. So they used the bacteria to make it possible for these long voyages. And right. when they were up there in the mass, pulling up the sheets or all of that, they were a little bit high, not terribly, but a little. If, if you read the early history of the United States, uh, people drank like fish and, and yes. there was a reason for that. Um, it, it was a lot safer to drink these alcoholic beverages than water that may have been contaminated, especially since they came to a new continent and they encountered various types of microorganisms in the water that would have caused them a great deal of harm. Of course, they also brought with them from Europe <laughs> microorganisms that decimated the local native populations. Right. Yeah, that's right. I had a, I had an experience um, uh, a number of years ago. I went back to Hungary, and I hadn't lived there in fifty some years at that time. And I went to uh, somebody's house in in a, in the countryside, and I was very thirsty. And um, I drank a glass of water, and it was well water. Everybody in that village, or in that household at least, was okay. I had developed such a terrible uh, intestinal problem, <laughs> culminating in horrible diarrhea as a result of drinking that water because I was not uh, used to the microorganisms, the particular bacteria that were present in that well water. And so, um, yeah, we, um, we're, we're better off from that standpoint, drinking an alcoholic beverage. That be called Budapest's revenge? Yeah, that's right, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Steve, actually, there is a book, maybe that's what you're referring to. It's called The Alcoholic Republic. And it yes. talks about how, yeah, how uh, people the early, in the early days, even children, hey, even routinely, children. yes, routinely drank cider, hard cider, right. or uh, watered down wine or whatever. Well, wine would be for the wealth, wealthier people, or unless someone had their own uh, grapes or whatever. But yeah, they made beer and the, the brew person was very, very important in each locale. Right. Um, it, because it, it really wasn't safe to drink the water most of the time. Right, and it, and it started out as a necessity, but then of course, a lot of people became alcoholic, which then eventually led to, um, you know, the, um, um, the prohibition ultimately in the 1920s because, um, because so many people were becoming alcoholics. Yeah. And the, um, you know, the, um, the, the campaigns against alcohol consumption. But then by that time, by the early 1900s, uh, water became a lot safer to drink, so. That, that's another fascinating story. The microbiology is just full of fascinating stories um, you know, that we could talk about for hours. <laughs> Other questions? I have a comment. Yeah, go ahead. I think Obi-Wan Jacoby is a fabulous name on the board. <laughs> Obi-Wan Jacoby is one of my sons. Yeah, that's just fabulous. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, to me, I think the force has been with you, Steve. Yeah, thank yep. you. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, well, I, I enjoyed and I hope I hope you got something out of this presentation. Excellent. I enjoyed Terrific. it too. Yes, terrific. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Very enjoyable. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure.
Um, okay, bye. Thank you. If anyone has any other you, questions Steve. or would like to get a hold of Steve, we do have a hotline. Um, please contact us if you have any, need any help or have any inquiries, we'd be glad to help. Thanks, Jeremy. All right, thank, thank you. you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye, everybody.